what's, uh, what's happening is that a large number of people around the world are getting to know about Islam, especially in the uh, English-speaking countries, Australia, Canada, and UAE. And yes, they do still speak English in, in England. Not very good, not like we do, but anyhow. And then, of course, here in the States. And then, particularly here in the States, we're seeing a large number of people actually entering into Islam after they learn about it. We have uh, folks in, in the Washington area, and we have folks uh, all the way to California and everything in between. The institutions where I used to work full-time published uh, information about this because it is something that's required for them to know. The military and the uh, prisons they have to know what the religious requirements of their uh, inmates or their, uh, you know, folks that are in, in the military, they have to know about it. So when people change from one religion to another, they make note of that. And then they can help them with their Ramadan and give them food early in the morning and then after the sun goes down. And they can give them time for their Juma on Fridays. So this is one of the places that we're able to get real statistics and not just something that you pull out of the air on an emotional basis and just say, oh, wow, you know, thousands and thousands of people are, nah, it's a bunch of baloney. But it is true that some people entered Islam immediately after 9-11, even on the same day. And I did research that myself, talked to the people myself. In fact, I went to, um, I went to, uh, <laughs> This Chicago, what do you want? <laughs> this is live. <laughs> I went to uh, several places in, uh, for a period of about a year after 9-11. And uh, everywhere I would go, I would talk to them, try to ask them about, you know, how many people came to Islam, how many people were affected positive or negative by all of the media that's going on and so on. And it wasn't until I went back to New York a year later that I found a person who had said he accepted Islam on the very same day. On the same day, and here's the strangest part of that. It was like 6 o'clock on September 11th, so it's still daylight. I don't think it was even time for Margaret yet. And he had gone to the masjid while all of this stuff was still going on, and you know, there's smoke still going up in the air from this whole thing, and it was, on. It was the closest mosque to the location of Ground Zero the closest one and he went in there and he asked them how do i get to become a muslim what do i need to do they thought it was a joke a prank or you know some kind of a, a weird uh, guy's trying to pull something in but uh, he told them no he said that when i saw this happen i realized that that there is no guarantee any of us are going to live another second we don't know how long we're going to live and I just felt like I needed to do it. something I wanted to do for a long time. I've been thinking about it. But now he said, uh, I hope, you know, God's going to accept for me. I need to do this. And he accepted Islam. So as far as how many people entered Islam after 9-11, I don't think anybody knows. I think only Allah has that kind of information. I think what's important to know, though, is that even as close to the location of this tragedy happens, that you have people right there are able to see through what's really going on in this world. And there are some people that can see through things. They're able to understand. You don't have to tell them what they're seeing. They understand it. But now I'm going to break off from that a little bit and talk about that subject of somebody telling you what to think about what you see. We're a nation today of people who do that. We actually watch an event vicariously through the media, through the television or movies, things like this. And we see a sporting event as an example. Then we see it replayed from a different camera view, another take of the same thing. And then we have announcers sit there and tell us what we saw. And we seem fascinated with that. And again, and again, and maybe the, even if it's a real hot one, it'll make it to the news and they'll pr play it a couple times in the news. You know, you might say, okay, well, that's sports, and maybe it, we do like to see those actions again. Well, you know, 
And plus, maybe somebody did an amazing feat. He really hit the ball out of the park or he really nailed the basket or the hoop. And, you know, we want to see that again and again. Especially if I had money on the game and I won, I really like to drive it home, you know. But let us take another subject. When we see a politician, a celebrity, get up in front of the camera and give a long speech, a long talk, you know, in some of the State of the Union, I call it State of the Onion. You know why? Huh? Well, it makes me cry and it smells bad. But anyway, this, uh, this is another thing about us that here we watch this thing and it's been on every single channel. You couldn't get away from it. And then, immediately afterwards, here come the guys telling us how we should think about what we saw. This is their take on what was said. And now we're going to take you now to Berkeley, and here is so-and-so, and he's going to, and now we're going to go to Princeton University, and we've got this guy going to give you his take on it, and now we're going to go to such and such organization in this think tank, and they're going to say, well, how does that affect everybody? And this is how you need to think about what you just saw. Which, in the case of Mr. Bush, is kind of helpful, because you know, otherwise you would... Not real sure. What, what, what did he say? You fool me once, or fool me twice, or fool me once again. No, no, that's the wrong song. Anyway, <laughs> with, with this kind of a, a situation, you got something being presented in front of you, which, for all intents and purposes, may or may not really be exactly what really happened because when you've got cameras like we've got one right here right now there's things you can do the angles that you can take the lighting the way you can distort things especially today with the graphics programs that are you don't know what you really saw and then to have somebody come back on top of it and tell you hey it's like this it's like that it's like so and so and if they do offer, and in some cases they do uh, offer a chance for you to express a question or an opinion. You feel like, ah, there's our chance to say, hey guys, I didn't see it that way. And you get to submit that. The problem there is not everybody who submits their replies or rebuttals gets aired. You don't really get to see all that. In fact, that can be another very interesting way to tell you what you saw by controlling the information that comes in there as though somebody's criticizing and then you respond back and then it's like oh wow now i totally agree with you okay thanks mom and i'll be home later you know <laughs> that's how they can do more of that same kind of brainwashing so i think now you can understand what i'm leading up to what i'm saying is that we live in a society today where there are a number of people trying to control the masses through media and through the uh, you know different events that take place and talk to us through books through movies and and set a mindset for us and tell us this is how you need to think about what you see now if you wonder about this is this something new is this a phenomenon that just started yesterday ah, 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 ah. now nah. thousand years ago there was a, a group that tried to pull something off and they wanted to test the water for it an idea that they had there's basically a takeover they had in mind and what they did was they used plays they put stuff in these various plays and put it on in different places to see the reaction of the people and they found that that wasn't the right time to try to do their little deal and they put it off and it, even before that we had people practicing scenarios and testing things to see what would the reaction of the people be could we keep them in control if we introduce a bigger tax what would happen when where's the breaking point where they aren't going to take it anymore so how far back do you want to go but there's a very old chinese almost like proverb story i don't know if any of you remember it's called the king has no clothes emperor the emperor has no clothes remember the story how that the emperor was so vain that he just loved to show off uh, his clothes and he loved to do parades and he was always out in front of the people. And so a couple of shysters came to him and said that they wanted to uh, produce for him a solid gold outfit that he could wear and they knew how to weave gold into thread and then they would make this golden wardrobe for him. And it would have a special capacity, it would have a special feature to it and that would be that if anybody couldn't see it, it meant they were not fit for their position. 
you would know who is need to be kicked out of your, you know, uh, close uh, cabinet there. You could kick them out because obviously they weren't fit. Well, they let this word get out right away, you know. So what happens when these guys are making this phony fabrication? It's not really there. They're just taking the gold. But they were going through the motions and a spinning wheel and everything and looking like they're doing something. People were going, they don't see anything. And they would say, uh, do you see anything? Do you see anything? Well, you know, if you don't see anything, you're not fit for your position. I just want to see if you can see it. I, I, it's lovely. It's really, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, I never saw anything like it, you see. And so then when they gave him the, the wardrobe to put on to go to the parade, his closest advisor is looking right at him. And uh, there he's going through the motions and putting the stuff on. And he said, well, he said, uh, it's fabulous. Unbelievable. He said, really? It's unbelievable. The emperor buys it, you know, he goes for it. So here he goes in this parade now in front of all the people. And they've all gathered and they all heard the rumors. They all heard about this. If you don't see it, you're not fit for your position. So here he comes down. He's got nothing on, okay? And he's walking along, strutting him. And the people are like, whoa, whoa, yeah, hey, mm, good, yeah, look at that. Shiny, too. Yeah, that's really... I don't say anything like it. Me either. No. It's amazing stuff here. Until it comes that a man is standing there with his little boy. And the little boy goes, Daddy, how come the emperor has no clothes? And the father looks at him and says, Son, son, do you want people to think you're not fit for your position? No, but how come the emperor has no clothes? <laughs> and then the people started realizing, the little boy doesn't have a new position. He's, not a, he's just a little kid. And so they realized the emperor has no clothes. The close of the story is that he goes on through the whole thing. And even after he hears the people saying that, because of his pride, he goes all the way to the end of it. And then, of course, he issues an order to bring back those little rascals and deal with them <laughs> post-haste. Nonetheless, what I'm trying to get across is that we today have still people amongst us that have this innocence about them, and they're able to see through it. They can see through this, and they go, uh-uh, I ain't buying this. The emperor's got no clothes. That's how it is. Unfortunately, the, and this is not just about Islam. This is a lot, a, a lot of other topics and, and a lot of other uh, countries yeah, that are bothered with the same kind of thing. To give an image of something that, that sells, that has a purpose behind it. There's a reason for why these people do it. Unfortunately, as I was saying, though, the Muslims haven't any uh, media to come back against that. Hey, do any of you remember that at the time of uh, the Afghani thing going on over there, that the Afghanis or Taliban, they captured a woman reporter, a journalist. Do you remember that story? And they made such a big thing. Oh, what must they be doing to her? And oh my God, you know. And, and by the way, they hoped that these guys would kill her or do some horrible thing to her, you know, and dismember her body and throw the parts out somewhere. And they said it would be great news. So when she came walking back with a Quran under her arm, and they were like, huh? And she told me herself, that they come in and say, what did they do? They did? And she said, no, it's not like that. And immediately they started turning off cameras and walking away from her. That wasn't the story they needed to hear. They needed to hear, yeah, they tortured me, they were killing me, you can't believe it. I can't even say on TV all the horrible things they did. Well, you can't say something on TV today. It must be horrible, because they say everything. But no. She's saying that actually what happened, these guys treated her with the utmost respect, and she had full privacy even though she was in jail. And they gave her everything she asked for, but they just wouldn't let her go. One of the things that they finally told her was, and she said, I was very rude, I was bad to them. She said, I cursed them. She was giving them the kind of language that you know people were imagining that maybe she was getting. It was the other way around. And this is all in her testimony about the whole thing. She said that at one point they came to her and asked her, if, you know, if we let you go, will you promise to do one thing? 
She said, I knew that was a trick. That was a big trick. She said, and then all they said was, uh, would I read the Quran? And I'm like, ha, ah, yeah, what else do you want? She said, I, uh, I would have said anything. I would have told them that I would learn Mandarin Chinese, you know, if they would just let me go. So she said, I had no intention of keeping my word whatsoever. I just wanted out. But I knew they wouldn't let me. And when I said, yeah, I will, they said, okay, you can go. And took her to the border and made sure she got across safely. And then, and they left her with the Quran. Well, when she tried to tell this story, that never made the main, mainstream news. Instead, they said, well, she had to go in for some treatments, and they didn't know what's happening with her. She has some maybe psychological problems. She was babbling, and <laughs> her name is Yvonne Ridley. Yvonne Ridley. Yvonne Ridley is an amazing person in herself. Even before she came to Islam, she was outspoken, taking everybody to task for their political uh, corruption and everything in the government. She was really out there, and that's why they sent her to Afghanistan, because they knew that she'd get a story, and she did. She dressed up like one of the Muslim ladies, covered herself up, stuck the camera under there and tape recorders, and she goes, but they caught her, because if you don't know Islam, you don't know the habits of what Muslims do, and they'd be like, this lady's acting really weird over here. What's with this? So she got caught. She did not become a Muslim. She didn't. What she did was read the Quran like she promised, finally. And she realized that there's nothing in here like what we've been saying in the news. This is not the same thing. Step by step she studied and then she started emailing to me and we talked and she became a Muslim, alhamdulillah. True story. And then she started with a TV company in Egypt. And these guys saw her coming and cleaned her out financially and let her get into some stuff and think that she was going to have a TV show and that she was going to bring me over there. We're going to do all this stuff. And then the last minute, they pulled the rug out from under her. And she said, I can't believe Muslims would do that. I said, well, guess what? Unfortunately, that's one of the bad sides of Muslims. Islam is perfect, but Muslims aren't. And in fact, the reason Muslims are in such a decaying shape today is the fact that they don't really follow Islam. And that's why they're in this shape. There's no other reason except that. Muslims do not follow Islam, and as long as they don't, you're going to see them down. When Muslims follow Islam, then they'll be back up just like they were a thousand years ago in Spain, in Egypt, and around the world. But they have to follow real Islam. They can't make it up and they can't do this weird stuff. Anyhow, she got a show on the Islam channel. And it was a, a show where she would bring people in and take them to task for what they were doing. And she would make real clear what her opinion was. And she would take the newspaper, daily newspaper, and hold it in front of the camera. And then she'd go to work on what the headline says. Yeah, the headline says this, but let's read behind the headline. Well, it didn't take much of that before the powers that be said, well, you know, this is too controversial of a program. Now, the viewership that they had is minuscule compared to the BBC and the rest of it. It's minuscule. But yet, the biggest program they had was her program. And they needed her off the air. And they finally did it finally got her off. So, what Brian mentioned in all of this is to let you know that we as Muslims today need to work toward getting this message out more and more and more to see. Not that, that God needs help, and he, has, he doesn't. This is not for him, this is for us. We need help from him, and he's not going to give us anything unless we get to work. There's an expression in the Quran which in English means that the Lord does not change the condition of the people until the people change themselves. And until, less than until we're ready to start making some adjustments and coming around to what he's ordered us to do, it's not going to get any better. And that's just a, a straight up fact of life. Allah has mercy, so much mercy. And Allah has patience and he's giving us mercy and patience every day to make changes. So this, let's take advantage of that and let's begin 
I'm saying even from this day, to work harder at improving ourselves, following the real Islam, and then using our own life as the example for the people to see. Now, I receive a lot of emails. A lot of people ask me about questions about Islam. Many of them become Muslims. Some don't. But I don't try to convert people to Islam because it won't work anyway. What I try to do is to show the best possible answer for the question they have from whatever understanding I, that I'm able to gain from the Quran and from the teachings of Muhammad, from the Arabic, from the Arabic language. And along the way, I received some harsh questions, some really tough ones, nasty ones even. But I try to keep my cool and provide them with the right answers and then let Allah deal with it. And today is no exception. Uh, about three or four o'clock this morning, I received a couple of emails and uh, answered one, and that one accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. The second one, I'm still working on them, and I haven't got their answer back yet, but it was a very detailed answer. And this one, the first part of it, when I read it, I was so amazed at the things the person said. I have it, I have it for you, actually, on here, and uh, she says, uh, Hello, Yusuf Estes, God bless you. And she says her name. She says, I'm from a Spanish-speaking Pentecostal Christian church. She talks about being married to a Muslim for four years. But she said, I told him from the beginning I would never convert to Islam. And she comes from a very strong upbringing in the faith of Pentecostal Christian. She said, even though I secretly never understood the Holy Trinity, one day I came home from one of my college classes and it was in the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting. I saw my husband sitting in front of a laptop watching a lecture about Jesus and God. She talks about how amazed she was. And it was about, it was Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahimullah. And he was saying something that made so much sense, especially in the debate, is Jesus God? She said, I did not let my husband see my emotion, but I was shocked. I was scared of what I had just seen. And I was scared even of my own thinking now, because what if what I had been taught all this time was false? She said, I couldn't accept that, so I began to talk to a Muslim friend over the phone a couple of days later. I told him, that person that if I were to die after we hang up the phone and I went to heaven and saw the true triune God, then I was right. But if I don't see a triune God waiting for me, then you're right. So then, uh, 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 hung up the phone, said, uh, then about 6 a.m., I think it was, I went to my bedroom to sleep, and I said, my God, my creator, the one who was never created and just exists, what is the truth? What is the truth? As I said this to God, I found I was sobbing the whole time. Now, mind you, I said this with my heart and with my mind, but not my mouth so that the devil would not hear me and he would not be able to take advantage of me. So I fell asleep. When I fell asleep, I was taking, taken up into the heaven in my dream. It was so bright and white, and I saw this book floating right in front of me. I glanced to see that the title of this book was, and it was right on the cover, and it said, Quran. The Quran was made out of pure gold. The cover and the letters were gold. It was so bright. It was the most beautiful thing my eyes had ever seen. Then I spoke and I said, but I've been worshiping the triune God all my life. And then I heard a loud voice. It was like all the voices of the humans coming together. And the voice said to me, but Allah says, worship me and worship me alone. Do not make partners with me in worship. And when I heard these words, the Quran opened to the first page. And I told him that Jesus died on the cross. And the voice said, but Allah says, and then the pages of the Quran started turning until it came to a part about Jesus. And it said he wasn't crucified. And the verses were spoken to me in English. 
and the and the dialogue I had with this continued on until it was all covered everything in the Quran every page every verse till the end and then the book closed shut and I woke up and the very next day I had another dream I had a dream I was dressed in all black with a black hijab on and I entered my church and I went straight up to the podium I told the people about my dream and it was a true path and I know you guys are going to think I'm crazy but this is the truth and I will pray that God guides you to the right path then I said peace be to all of you and I walked out of the church I argued with myself back and forth and with my uncle and he's a pastor I also spoke with my pastor at the church until the point that they convinced me that the dreams must be from the devil so I continued as a strong Christian believer until a couple days ago something keeps bringing me back to Islam I keep thinking and reading and studying and searching about Islam and I keep having these dreams like the other night, I had a dream that I was eating at a restaurant with my husband, and again, I was dressed in black hijab. And the waitress was pointing at me and telling me, what are you doing? Islam's from the devil, and you're going to go straight to hell. And the whole restaurant was white, and the dream scared me. I'm confused, scared, because my family would disown me. But all I ask God in my prayers is to please guide me, take me by the hand, lead the way. I just want to live and breathe for God. I want to do what's right. I want to serve Him. I don't want my soul to perish. What was the turning point that led you to declare your shahada? She's talking to me. What made it click for you? I feel like I'm still far from declaring the shahada. Like when I think of the book of Revelation in the Bible, and the prophecies, and the rapture, and all that. I feel like I'm being pulled by a rope, like a tug-of-war. Islam versus Christianity. I have read articles upon articles from your websites, your lectures, and, and the Watch Islam channels. Please help me. Now, how many of you here are you Muslim already? How many are already Muslim? Do we have any that are not Muslim yet? Somebody's not Muslim. Okay, from what I've said, can, I don't, I don't want to look at Dunkin' Donuts, I want to look at you. I, I, if I see that sign anymore, I'm going to go crazy. I'm hungry. Okay. I want to see you. How are you doing? Okay. Now, we're not going to put the camera on anybody here except me because we didn't take your permission, number one. Number two, it's not necessary for us to try to prove anything. What I'm asking you, though, is, and everybody here, from what you just heard from this person, what do you think about the dreams that she had? Do you think these dreams were from the devil? This is real. I didn't make this up. I received it this morning. If I was going to make it up, I'd have had better English on it. I'm a nut about that. So what should I say to them? What should I tell them? They told her that these dreams are from the devil. What is the proof for us as Muslims that we know that it can't be from the devil? She said it herself. What did she say? Did you catch it? See how clear your mind works now. See what comes to you. When she talked about the dream, she said something that's very key, that even the Christians, if they're thinking, they should have caught it too. What is it? She said, I didn't even move my mouth. I did it in my heart. So now, this means, if you think the devil gave her that dream after she asked the one who created her, she didn't ask Jesus. Did you catch that? When you ask anything other than the law, then that's what has to answer your prayer. And obviously it can't, so you're going to get deceived. Therefore, she's praying to who? The one who created her. And she's asking him. So you've got two choices now. If you're going to say that this is not from God, A, you have to say that the devil has the power to go in and catch her thinking and her prayers and overpower God and take over and God has nothing to stop her when she's asking the truth from him. Or B, B, that God doesn't care and he lets the devil just take over and do that. 
That's even before we analyze what is the dream. Because when anybody asks God to wreck, how could their answer be from anybody but him? Now, it could be no. The answers can always be no. We know that. Or the answer could be later. Or you can get what you want now. But never could the devil intercede and do something and overpower God and try to answer your request. Does that, does that make sense? It's just common sense. So it means that was from God. Would God trick her when he asked? She's being uh, uh, guided to ask him direct. So if he's going to trick her with that, like, oh, you dare ask me direct? <laughs> I'll send you out here to the scarecrow and the tin man and, you know, what is this? This is nuts. In the dream, she said she saw a white book. What color is the Bible? Almost always. Black. Did you notice that? You ever thought about that? Why is the Bible always black? It wasn't the Bible. It definitely wasn't. And it said Quran on it, even though I would have asked her if I'd been there, and it was, I would have said what language, because if it's Quran, it had to be written in Arabic. But it was for her dream anyway, not for me. What was it that she said? Then she said, the book opens up, and she said, but I've been worshiping the triune God. That's the first thing she says. Well, the Quran is telling her to worship the one God. It says it clearly, one God, without any partners. Does the Bible say that? Is it in Exodus chapter 20, Thou shalt have no other gods beside me? Is it also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Thou shalt not have any gods beside me? Is it also in the book of Hosea chapter 13 verse 4, I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, you know other God beside me? Beside me there's no other Savior. Shall I keep going verse in scripture? Do you get the picture? Uh, but that's Old Testament. A lot of these guys will say, That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Jesus came and brought the New Testament. Hallelujah. Well, what's that New Testament say? They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Did that sound like three? I don't know, does it look like three? Well, yeah, it does because you got three joints. So you got this part of the finger and this part right there. That's that's three right there. That proves Trinity, you know. <laughs> Have you seen that? No, no, that's that proves Trinity right there. Even your finger has three parts. But that's not counting the fingernail. Because then that's four. And if you count the knuckle, that's five. The point that I'm trying to get at is that we don't find any evidence anywhere, anywhere throughout the Quran to substantiate anything other than one God. It's consistent. It doesn't contradict itself. It is constantly saying one God, one God, one God. Something that uh, I didn't tell her, I thought about it after I finished the letter to her, how you answered her. But it came in my mind afterwards how many of you read the Quran in Arabic? Anybody read it in Arabic? In Arabic. Do you ever notice something? Every single page has God's name on it. And you won't know that. I didn't know that until I got one of the red letter editions of Quran. Now, there's a red letter edition of Bible, which is anything Jesus says is in red. Well, that would be easy for Quran, just use red ink, because everything there came from Allah. <laughs> so there's no reason to do that. But what they do in the red letter edition of the Quran is anywhere Allah's name or his attributes uh, or Lord or uh, Rabbi, uh, Rab is mentioned, it's in red. Have you seen that? You seen one? You have one too? Okay, next time you got one, open it up and notice that it's on every single page. There are two pages out of 604 that don't have it. But the adjoining pages have it so much it's almost a red page. I'm not joking. Now, if you want to try that with the Bible, go ahead and see how many pages you find there that don't have anything to do with God at all. 
how many chapters don't mention God at all, and one whole book doesn't mention God at all. One whole entire book. The story of Samson and Delilah doesn't mention God once. So which one is more from God? Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil what? Come on, come on, let me hear it. I don't understand you, you know. Tell me about the devil. How did the devil give you the, the, the Quran which has God's name on every single page? And then you got a book over here that doesn't have God in it at all. And you're going to tell me that's from God. And uh-huh. Yep. Tell me how to think. Tell me how to think. Tell me how to think about this. And I'm going to give you now some of the stuff I fed back to her because this lady's in a dilemma. She's got a problem. I gave her some questions. I'm just going to hit the highlights because I've got a website for this and I'm going to let the website do the talking for me. You remember the Da Vinci Code when it came out? Huh? Remember how the Christians got so bent out of shape over that? I didn't really want the book until I saw how much of the Christians got upset. I said, now i got to get that book. <laughs> That's got to be good. They made it into a movie. I went and saw the movie, too. You see, anybody see the movie? I didn't like the movie. I really didn't. I, th I felt like it. they were really cutting down Christianity bad in that movie because they were trying to, to make it look like these Jesuit priests or a bunch of sadistic uh, wackos. And, you know, that's not right. We got politicians for that. Go to Islam Code on the internet. Islam Code. I took the site before somebody could do it to us. Yeah, Islamcode.com. Talks about a lot of subjects. The first one I want to ask you, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. That's what they tell you right away. Unless they're Trinitarians, then he's one in three of the one God. Okay. If you have something that's two and you divide it into four or eight or 16, 32, 64, 128, if you can do that it real easily, okay? And nobody could argue about it. But when you have something that's one, even the structure of the sentence, the grammar, is different than it is for anything that's plural. Is that true? Yeah. So if I say this is one, I have to talk about it with the, the verb to be, has to be is, I have to say is, one is. We always say that. Everything else is A-R-E, R, right? Uh, two R, three R, four R, five R, a hundred R, a thousand R, but one is, yeah? So when they say God is one, structure sentence is correct. God is one. But can you say God is three not in English you need to say God are three but now you got another problem because the noun is still singular it doesn't match uh, so you're gonna have to say hmm gods are three okay I'm with that gods are 33,000 if you're a Hindu no problem but if you're a monotheist God is one and there isn't any way to explain it other than that one is one now they were trying to use different kinds of examples they'll never get into it to talk about the actual text itself because it's very clear there's nowhere in the bible that it ever says anything other than god is one there's nowhere you don't find that in fact the word trinity doesn't exist in the bible now when the Catholic Church took over one offshoot of Christianity, it was the year 325 AD in the month of August, the Emperor Constantine was presiding over the event and he needed to have a new church for Rome from some bad deeds he had committed. He boiled his own son and then he boiled his wife because she got upset about it. And it was for political reasons. He had to leave Rome 
and that's why he was in Turkey. That's where this took place. He moved over there, and he needed to find a way to get absolved of his sin because the religion they had at that time wouldn't absolve him. It's like, you know, you boiled your wife, you boiled your kid. I'm sorry, but you can't be emperor anymore. And, of course, that's why he did it, was to be able to remain as emperor. What he was looking for was a way to get out. And he found that because this particular sect of people calling themselves Christians told him that he could be forgiven if he would say Jesus was the Son of God and died for his sins. And he said, that's it, that's it. Well, gee, I don't even have to give you any money, huh? <laughs> that's a good deal. So he made them the official new church of Rome. But it had a lot of conditions. You can go to the Catholic website because that's where I went to get it. That's where I took it from. Of course, they presented in a nice flowery way, but bottom line is what it says. And it was in 325 that the Catholic Church took over this sect. And the Catholic Church was already in business. It was already the official Church of Rome for the last 300, uh, 650 years. It was originally established under uh, Alexander the Great. He's the one to come up with this idea that they would have these centers, which was like physical workout centers, like the judo guys and all that stuff, plus religion, plus, you know, health, and plus, you know, philosophy, plus, plus, plus. It was, you know, an all-encompassing uh, uh, place to go. And that was their religious centers, if you will. And if you wanted to be a full... Uh, citizen, Roman citizen, you must join that church. You could, by the way, you could still have your other gods. That was not a problem. But you had to give full pledge to the authority of the Roman church and what went with it. Because the Roman church was patterned after the Roman government. The Roman government was triune and so was their church. By the way, how do you say universal? Because they called it the universal church of Rome, but they said it in Latin. Do anybody here know how to say the word universal in the Latin language? Oh, yes, you do. You do know how to say it. You've said it before. Catholic. And it was always called that. So even when they took over that one part of Christianity, they didn't even change their name. Because they weren't becoming Christians. The Christians were becoming Catholics. The priesthood was already in place, the bishops were already there, the, the uh, cardinals, all that they came up with was already in place. That was nothing new. They didn't have to do anything new to get that. The bishops of the Christian churches, they had come and tried to reconcile a lot of things. About, about 1,100 were in attendance at that gathering. And since that time, there's only been one other gathering like it where they brought only religious leaders together to try to find reconciliation and peace. And then, by the way, that took place in the year 2000. And it was held in New York City, in the United Nations building. And yours truly was one of the delegates to that United Nations World Peace Summit for Religious Leaders. And from what I observed where I was and thought about going back 1,700 years to the time of the Catholic Church takeover, I said, wow, this is not really a lot different. We even had somebody presiding over it. We had one who came, and he was the richest man in the world who presided over it. And he brought his television cameras in there, and he gave a billion-dollar check to the UN to use the facility for that week of this World Peace Summit for Religious Leaders. It was two weeks before the World Peace Summit. Okay? Who was the guy? Ted Turner. Ted Turner. Excellent. Go to the head of the class. All right. And like Constantine, he had just converted to another religion, Jainism. He became a Jainist, Hindu. And everything there was slanted all over the place toward that religion. In fact, all the food that was served was all vegetarian. Everything. No animals were brought in there, and I mean, it's like, I thought it was for all religion. Yeah, it is. But you're going to eat what we say. You're going to sit where we say. You're gonna, yeah, uh-huh. Of course, they had uh, probably a hundred or more Muslim representatives from different parts of the world. 
I was the only one there, though, that would say Allahu Akbar instead of clapping for the things that took place. And Muslims are not supposed to clap. And, and if you know anything, even Christians know, a lot of them know, that clapping is from the Druid religion of scaring away the devils. When you get excited about anything, you clap and scares away the devils. That's where it came from. So Muslims aren't supposed to do that. We're supposed to say, Allah Akbar. You see something big? Allah Akbar. So guess what? I did. Now this got a lot of attention and people were looking at me every time it happened. And remember, these are only religious people. So they all knew right away what it was and who it was. If most of the Muslims had looked at me like, oh, don't do that. One that was with me, actually, with the group that I was with, turned and looked at me, and he's going, keep it up, keep it up, like this. Keep it up, good, good. And I said, what are you? I can't, I can't. It's government. That's what he said. So what happened, the group that was sponsoring me canceled my speech. Oh. Yeah. It's all right. Look how Allah made things work out. I had planned, you know, because I'm from Texas. Can you imagine a guy from Texas getting up there? They don't want that. That's the last thing in the world they wanted is a convert from Texas standing there and going, Hey, guys, what's up? <laughs> and they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> instead, instead, Shaitan was real tickled because they put an Arab up there from our group who couldn't speak English and he stood there in his full dress and from his country and everything. Like this. So what everybody did, most of them, this is a good time for a potty break and they left. The ones who stayed got to hear the translation of it provided for them courtesy of the Arab Christians. You will not find, you will not find any group more opposed to Islam and Muslims than the Arab Christians. You won't. Because they know Arabic. They know about the Quran and for the last, I think, almost 1400 years, they've been trying to find excuses not to accept Islam. It's a fact. So, anyway, when everybody came back, they had to finally get to the biggest speech of all. The man of the hour. The man with the billion dollar check. And so they brought him out. Kofi Annan was there. Oh, yeah. In fact, Kofi Annan had sent us to each of our hotel rooms. We received an invitation to attend a special dinner with Kofi Annan. I'm going, whoa, that's cool stuff. I'm going to sit down and we've got, you know, talk to this guy and see... When I entered the room, I looked over and there was like a hundred people all around him at a table no bigger than this one. I'm going, okay, forget that. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, what I did, I just walked off and sat by myself. And I said, let me just, uh, let me, uh, eat, get it over with, and just get out of here. Found a table that was in the far end of the room. Muslims passed me by, they didn't want to sit with me. They were trying to get over close as they could to a table close to Kufi Anand. Who came and sat with by me? A Jew. Now remember, everybody's a religious leader, so he's a rabbi, and he's sitting right by my right. He said, can I ask you a question? He said, when you said Allah Akbar, that means the Allah is the greatest, and something like this, and I'm going, yeah. Then another Jew sits down beside him and said, Can I ask you a question? How is it that when the Muslims do so and so, is it like, and you have kosher laws like us, yeah? Yeah. Well, we have halal, haram, yeah. He said, I get a question. What if, like, la, 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 a few minutes later, the Navy comes over and sits down beside me, the chaplain for the Navy. And he sat right beside me, and I'm going, Okay, because I'm feeling kind of like, how come I got all these Jews, you know? So, okay, I got the Navy. He'll be a Christian, right? He took off his cap, and guess what? Oh, yeah, only he's orthodox. They're reformed, so he's like against them. But he's asking me questions. And then another and another, two more Jews sat down over there, and they're all asking these questions. And I'm getting this real nice treatment from these guys, and the Muslims are ignoring me. And I'm thinking, man, where is this going? So what happened when they finally brought out the last day when they had Ted Turner's going to give his big speech? 
And this is not a secret because, duh, that's why he went there was to give him the money to put his cameras on so he could give his speech. So I'm not telling you any secret. He put it all over the world. He said, and they published it in the newspaper's front page in New York, or front page of a section anyway, Ted Turner says Christianity is for losers. He can get away with that. And if you or I would say that, they'd, okay, you're terrorists, you're going to jail. <laughs> but I don't believe that anyway. I don't think it's for losers. I think it's the very closest thing to Islam. Just need a little adjustment and thinking and you can make it. Undo some strange thoughts have been put on top of you and you can make it into Islam. It's not that hard. Anyway, he got up and they introduced him and in the introduction I remember so well they said, we're going to introduce to you now one of the richest men in the entire world. He owns more property, houses, buildings, apartments, and condominiums and real estate than anybody else in the world. Wow. That's pretty good. I was thinking, even the Catholic Church? But never mind. So he get up there. They said one man. See, the church is big. Oh yeah. So he got up, and there's, a, there's the podium. To get to that podium is the climb. You've got to get up these stairs, go up, 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 and it's like, huh. I'm glad I didn't get up there for any speech. Anyway, he's up there, and he started his speech out like this. He said, you know, I can't sleep at night. And I'm thinking, well, you shouldn't, you know, <laughs> crook. And he said, I can't sleep at night because I worry about the people of the world who have no home, no place to go, no place to even lay their heads down to sleep. I worry about that. And before, and I remember each one of us has microphones at UN. Before this one can catch his tongue, I said, hey, coming from the guy with the most real estate, he can solve the problem, just give him all the house. And everybody cracked up, except the Muslims, of course. They're like, no, shh, quiet, you know. <laughs> but these guys were cracking up. Now, remember this. I told you several times, these are all religious people. It means basically there's good in these guys. You don't, you don't accept to be a priest or a, a monk or, you know, you don't do that unless there's something good in you somewhere. You, because it's not a place to get money. And monks, hello, that's sure not a place to pick up chicks. It's, it's, well, you know, I'm just putting it out like it is. These people have sacrificed. And now here they are, and they're poor. We're all poor, and we're sitting here with the richest guy in the world, and we're like, you want us to feel sorry for you? I don't know how, you know. We're out here working with those people that you're talking about. You want to talk about not sleeping? We can't sleep. There's nothing to sleep on. SubhanAllah. So, yeah, they went crazy for that. They liked it. Then... When he got up to the top of the thing, when he first started his speech now, you know, before I said that, he looked at me and he forgot himself. He forgot himself totally. He forgot he's on TV. He forgot he gave him a billion dollars. He forgot that this is being transmitted across the entire planet. And he pointed right at me. And right away the cameras went, boink, right at me. And he said, are you going to say that again? That Allah, right, but you're going to say that again? And I go, it all depends on what you say. <laughs> so, even though it wasn't much, it had the effect. A short speech can reach the heart a lot better than a long, drawn out, you know, for sure. There's no joke about that. What I'm trying to tell you, and I keep coming back to the same thing is, Islam never wanted you to accept things blindly. If you have a question of faith, bring it. If something is bothering you, then let's get it taken care of. If you have a doubt, let's find out what it is. And if you have a question, let's get some answers. Islam makes a very bold claim. The bold claim is that Islam is for all people. All. A-L-L. All people, all places, and listen to this, all times. The Catholic Church is very proud of this, and one of the priests that I used to work with when we were going out of the prison together, and he said to me, you know, I love my religion. I said, good for you. 
and he was a little bit drunk because he liked to get you know bite the bite the grape just before he leaves you know out of there by the way he can have his wine right there in the prison because it's religious holy wine <laughs> holy moly wine anyway so he's coming out i like my religion i said good for you and he said you know why i said i'm sure you're going to tell me he said because we're always ready to adapt we can change to fit whatever the circumstance is that's the perfection of my religion think about that statement the perfection of your religion is that you can change it to fit whatever comes up <laughs> that's a good way to do it isn't it Whew. and then he gave an example he said you know when we meaning the catholic church went into south america we found them in worshiping there and they had a, a, a date or a festival already set up January 6th that they celebrated the Feast of the Epiphany, which means like a big uh, vision, dream, a prophecy coming in front of you or, you know, something like that. So they just changed Jesus' birthday to be the 6th of January. And that's when they celebrate Christmas. Did you know that? Go to South America and check it out. This is, well, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is the same thing, blah, blah, blah. And it fits because let's go back to the Catholic website and see what it says. That when Constantine took over, one of the things was that, they, and it says they changed the date of Jesus' birthday to become the same as the date of the birth of Mithras, which was their God that they already had in place, who was a miracle birth kind of a God and he's the son of two other gods, and he's blah, 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 blah. And he also died and was probably on a cross. And he, uh, But anyway, it lines up with Mithras. So they changed the date. That's the point I'm trying to make. Changed it. Which means that it wasn't December the 25th. Could have been any other day out of 365 that they got, but it was not December the 25th. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had to change it. They added, and it says on their website, the Feast of Ishtar. And we today say Easter. And that's where that came from. This was a, a ritual of, what's the, what's the nice way they always say that? Uh, the rabbits and the eggs of um, fertility. fertility. This is the word I'm looking for. The nice way to say it. It was a, it was a Roman orgy. That's what it was. That was what it was all about. People walking around naked and doing whatever. And that's what the real Feast of Ishtar was all about. And they introduced that. And they go on with other things they did. One of the things, though, it's very clear, is they decided what was canonical for the Bible. 325 years after Jesus. 325 years later, they're going to decide what is Bible, what is not. What needs to be hidden from the people called apocrypha have you heard of apocrypha that's what it means what's hidden from the people now my father was a minister and he had his own copies of the apocrypha before it was published for the public you can get it now at barnes and noble borders books and music amazon.com you can get these books but back then you couldn't but i've got the old ones that dad had some of the apocrypha and you read it and you're going to go huh what is this this isn't, uh, I would never buy into this thing. It's too far out. Now, I'm kind of jumping around on the topics, but what I'm trying to do is let you have some idea about this thing of people just telling you how to think. If you need a religion where people tell you how to think, Islam is not really for you. There are sects within Islam, such as XYZ, which I won't mention, but they will tell you how to think, if that's what you need. But if you really want to have full Islam, you need to keep using your brain every day. Because saying Shahada and getting into Islam did not guarantee you anything yet. You have to die on it. That's one of the biggest conditions of the Shahada, is you have to die on it. So no matter what you're saying today, no matter how you feel today, if you die tomorrow and you're not on that, too bad. It's, it really counts in Islam what shape you were in at the moment of death. So, and when a person's coming close to death, that's really when they 
say what they really mean and g give it up, basically. So this is an important thing for us to consider. I have a website, I have a bunch of websites, but I have one that deals with this subject of the nine points of Shahada. I wish you would really uh, look into that. The Shahada is something very, very important and you need to look into it and, and understand that. Because you're searching, right? This is life. Even after you get to Islam, you're still searching for more, for more. Don't stop. You just begin. Shahada is one step out of a journey of a million miles in Islam. It never ends until you die. It's, every day you're learning. Every day you're experiencing. Every day you're getting more reward from Allah. Every day you're getting more forgiveness from Allah. Every day you're getting more tests from Allah. All, all these things are all part of your life as a Muslim. It's exciting. You're never bored. with the folks of the Dean Show. So all of you out there at the Dean Show, uh, make the offer Eddie and his group because they're going to be showing this on their programs. And inshallah, this is going to be distributed all over the world. In fact, I forgot to mention, we have online uh, a whole group of folks that are watching this in different parts of the world right now. And so, let's get started. That's enough introduction. Oh, my name. My name is Yusuf. Can you say Yusuf? Yusuf. Well, you said it right the first time. My wife has been married to me all these years. She still says useless. <laughs> but I wanted to talk to us about today is something that's very crucial to every single Muslim on the planet. But especially those who are coming into the fold of Islam and they don't really understand what they're getting into. I want to mention that this is going to be talking about the nine points of the Shahada itself. When a person enters into Islam, they are basically giving a testimony of faith called the Shahada, which says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammad al Rasulullah. It means more or less in English that I bear witness in open testimony that there is no God worthy of any worship other than the one true God, Allah. He has no partners and I bear witness in open testimony that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who lived in Saudi Arabia 1400 years ago, is his last, his final messenger, and he's the one who brought the message that we just said, no God to worship except one. This is the meaning behind it. And you want to get meaning, sometimes you won't find the words from Arabic to English exactly. So you need to know how to get the information. We'll be talking about that in some of our other programs. Today we want to focus on these points. This was never mentioned at the time of Muhammad that there are nine points of the Shahada. That is not from there. That's not where we got it from. And since that time, there have been those who have said there were six points. Some said there were seven. Some had said eight. And I found a booklet that said nine. And I just went with that because it had everything there. All of the others, they cover the same points, but some of them they group together. That's why you're going to know some of these are very similar, but I just want to be sure we cover the points. The first thing that a person must have as a Muslim is the knowledge of what they're saying. The knowledge of what it is. Because you could actually get somebody to say it, like you could train a parrot to say, a shadow of illallah. And you say, wow, the parrot just became a Muslim. But it's not. So a person could say that and not have a clue what they're talking about. So this is the first and foremost thing. And it says in the Quran in chapter uh, 47, verse 19, it's Surah Muhammad. It said, so know that there is no God except Allah and ask forgiveness for your sin. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever dies knowing that there's no deity worthy of worship, except Allah will enter paradise. He also uh, said, and this is in the Quran, in Surah Al-Zukhruf, uh, verse 86, except him who bears witness unto the truth knowingly. The meaning that nobody will enter the paradise except these. 
So this is the first and most obvious of all conditions that if you're going to say there's no God to worship, worthy of worship except Allah, and if you mean it, that's great. But if you mean it's Jesus, it won't work. And if you mean that it's, you know, a rock or a stick or a bone or a statue or something like that, it's not going to work. It has to be the real God. So you do have to understand that. The second thing is that a person has to have certainty or what's called in Arabic, yaqeen. Yaqeen means that the person has no doubt whatsoever in it. And before I give shahada to people, that's one of the things I always say to them in their language. If you speak English, I'm going to ask you in your language, is there any doubt in your mind? Is there any doubt? Do you really know there is God? There really is a God? Are you sure? And they say, yes. Okay. But if they say, no, you know, I still have some doubts, I say, then stop right there and let's deal with that. And when you're removing that, we can come back. But otherwise, full stop, shahada is not going anywhere until we remove these doubts. Because this is not a contest to rack up how many did you get today and how many did I get today. It doesn't matter. In fact, if you, if you know this, in Islam we know that there was a prophet of Allah who came and he gave the message to his people throughout his whole life and not a single person accepted. Nobody. Another prophet came and through his whole life gave the message and only one person accepted. There were some that had only a few. There were some that had some good number of people, but they couldn't get the ones that they wanted the most. Abraham is one of those. He couldn't get his father. Noah couldn't get his own son. The prophet Lut, called Lot in English, could not get his own wife. The Bible said she turned back into a pillar of salt, but we know what happened. She stayed there in Sodom and Gomorrah and became one of those people and was destroyed. So this doubting business has to be out of your mind. You have to know there really is God. He's one. He has no partners. He always was and always will be. And that's the God we're talking about. So you have to have firm belief in it. Allah says about it in Surah Al-Hujrat, that's chapter 49, verse 15, the true believers are only those that believe in Allah and His Messenger, and afterward they do not doubt, and they strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah. These are the sincere. Allah also says in the Quran in Surah number 9, Surah Al-Tawbah, verse 45, they alone seek leave of you not to participate, the, who believe not in Allah in the last day, and those hearts feel doubt, so their doubt is what causes them to waver. And what the, I'm going to have to give you a translation of the English now, because when it says they seek leave, this is old English. That means that they're trying to get permission to get away from you because they don't want to fight. They're basically saying, yeah, right, uh, uh, you guys are going to go into the war, okay, no, 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 no. And so their they're doubt, though, is what really was causing them to do this. Uh, so that's point now. We've, we've talked about point number one is his knowledge. Number two, certainty, no doubt. Let's talk now about point number three, which is acceptance. Acceptance here is talking about that you will accept everything that goes with it. <laughs> there's no benefit in saying, oh, there's only one God and Muhammad's his messenger and uh, that's it. Hmm? Not going to do anything about it. Still going to the same bars, still smoking cigarettes, still hanging out with the wrong people and not worshiping Allah. Doesn't work. That because this is not something of the lips. It's something that the heart and the mind have to have conviction on. And this conviction will causes a person to really accept what comes and they're going to do it. If you know for sure that there's one God and you know for sure he sent you a message, are you going to act on the message that you got? Because if you are, that's good. But if you said, nah, I don't care, I'm not going to do it, I don't have to. Then you become in the category with the devil himself because that's his problem. That's exactly the problem that he has. He refuses to obey Allah. Allah says in chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, verse 85, Do you believe in part of the book and reject part of it? And what's the reward for those who do that? Except that they will be humiliated in this life, on this world, and on the day of judgment, they will be sent to the most dreadful doom. So, this is very important. Let's go to the next point, point number four is submission 
and compliance. This is the logical next step from what I just said. If you accept it, now what are you going to do? Let's talk about it. This implies the actual physical enactment of our deeds that align with the Shahada. It is one of the meanings of the word itself of Islam. Islam comes from a word in Arabic, a root called Aslama, Aslama. And when you bring it to this uh, beautiful perfected state and you say Islam, you're saying five things in the English language all at once. You're looking at all five at one time. You can imagine the dimension of this word. It's very powerful. It means surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. But all of them are existing at the same time. All five. Hmm? And these five are one. No, no, wait a minute. We're going back to the Trinity thing. <laughs> but seriously, if one of these is not there, then it's not the full Islam anymore. You have to have all of this at one time. There has to be this sense of giving up to the Lord, then the sense of surrendering to whatever he wants, and then obeying his commandments to the full and complete ability that you have. Whatever ability you have, you're going to go all the way. And then you do it sincerely, even if nobody else is looking, and even if everybody else is criticizing you about it. It doesn't matter. I'm not trying to please anybody but him. And it, sometimes you'll find, and this is a strange thing for a new Muslim to realize, sometimes the actual enemy on this one is Muslims themselves. Some girls are being told by their own parents who are Muslims not to wear hijab. Some boys being told by their parents who are Muslims, don't grow your beard. And yet these are things in Islam that you're supposed to do. So it means that you have this submission to Allah to the extent that, and it's in Surah Al-Zumr, verse 54, turn unto him repentant and surrender to him. So there's a full, complete surrender to Allah. Allah also says, and this is in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, verse 125, who is better in religion than the one who surrenders his purpose to Allah while doing good. And actually Allah has made it clear in this condition of faith that whoever submits to the command of Allah and his messenger, then Allah says this. And this is in chapter 4 on Misa, verse 65. And I'm going to give you the, before I give you this verse, I want you to understand how it comes. The way it is in Arabic, it's the strongest verse in the Quran of swearing of Allah. Because Allah swears. He swears by things that he's created. And he swears by things that we don't even understand. He even swears by the passage of time when he says, Wal Asr. And he swears by something small. And he swears by something big. Watini, wa zaytun. This is by the fig and by the olive. Wa turisin. And this is Mount Sinai. And this is the whole area of Mecca. That he created the human beings in the best form, the best mold. And reduced them to the lowest of low. And in here it's talking about for these people that have the right faith. And they have the right actions. And for them will be this great ajr, this great um, blessings, rewards coming to them from Allah subhanahu wa And he asks us, Alay salahu bi khamil Who is there would be a judge outside of Allah subhanahu wa Then there is none other but him. Isn't he the best of the judges? So I want you to understand that he swears and he says some mighty things when he swears. But the verse I'm going to give you now from, the, from uh, Surah, that was Surah Atin. This is Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 65. Listen to the swearing here. Nowhere else in the crown you find this. He swears on himself. God swears on himself. He says, No, 
but by your Lord, meaning himself. They have no iman, they have no belief until they make you, Muhammad, as a judge in the matters wherein they dispute and then they don't find anything inside of themselves to dislike what you've decided and they submit with full submission. To who? To the teachings of Muhammad. So this immediately, that verse makes it clear, whoever tells you, you can accept the Quran, but you don't have to take the Sunnah or the Hadith of Muhammad, they are liars. They are the devil themselves talking to you. That verse is clear. That verse is the one where he's swearing on himself, telling Muhammad that the people have to make Muhammad as a judge in the matters where they dispute and then come away with nothing inside of them except to say what? And Allah says in the Quran, this is the saying of a believer, Sinitna wa atatna. We hear and we obey on the spot. Have you heard the expression, when I say jump, you say how high? Well, you know, in Islam, if Allah told you to jump, you say how high? Well, you're jumping. You don't wait. And he's being real clear about this. So, all of the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, if you can verify that he really said it, that's the only dispute there might be with somebody, did he really say it? Let us investigate the chain of authority, how we got it, and so on, yes. But if somebody come to you and say, hey, I don't need to worry about that, <laughs> how do you think we got the Quran? How did we get the Quran? Do you think that Muhammad sat there and wrote it down? You think some people just wrote it down and passed it out? Is that what you heard? Well, if you heard that, you're wrong. Because the Prophet didn't know how to read or write. What he heard from the angel Jibril, he memorized, repeated, and talked to his companions the same way. It was written at his time, but that was not considered Quran. That was called the Suhuf or Mus'haf, scripture. I mean, it's still called that today. Quran means that which is recited. What you hear being recited is the Quran. What you heard me say in Arabic, that was Quran at the time I said it. No, when I stopped, it's gone. Got it? A song, you know about music? A song is a song when you hear it. People write music, don't they? But can you hear anything? Maybe you hear the pen being dragged across the paper, but you don't hear the music when it's written down. It represents the music, doesn't it? Somebody has to play the music. Huh? Somebody give you a piece of paper and say, there, you know, this is the latest Michael Jackson thing or some from the Backstreet Boys or from whatever. And you say, on a piece of paper, you're going, okay, and give me 15 bucks for it. <laughs> Get out of here. You're crazy. But here's the DVD. Oh, that's another story. You follow? So in the same way, you can look at what we're talking about here. The Quran, this word iqra, means recite, not read. And Quran means that which is being recited. And we have a lot of bad translations, a lot of translations that are real old, that nobody has really taken the time to update. So when you read it, you get the wrong words in English. And there's no way you're ever going to get a perfect translation of Quran to English. So, by the way, learn Arabic. Don't wait. It's the best way to do that. I took a lot of time on that one because that is a critical point with a lot of Muslims today. That's a very critical point. Next point is, number five, is truth. Asadiq. It, and it's opposed, the opposite here is hypocrisy, nifaq, and dishonesty. Someone who is kadib, a liar. And this means that when we say the Shahada, we are saying it with total honesty. And we actually mean it, not lying. Now, if, and it happened to me. I gave Shahada to a man one time, and about, and he came around my house, and he would follow me around and go here and go there. And he was an Arab, an Arab Christian. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. He came all the way up there and was hanging around me again. And then finally he said, I want to tell you something. I lied. When I said the Shahada, I was lying. I was just trying to hang out with you and see what this is all about, who you Muslims are. And I was actually working with some agencies and giving them reports on you. And he said, but now I found out Islam really is true. He said, I can, I can see, I can see by your actions, this is for real. You believe this. I want you to talk to me some more. If you don't hate me. I said, I don't hate you. <laughs> Anybody's got the guts to come up to me and tell me that. <laughs> I trust you more than anybody right now because other people, I don't know what they're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Within a short time, he accepted Islam. And we talked about the Shahada. He said, I feel like I need to do it again. I said, you absolutely have to. Because when you said it before, 
You didn't mean it. So it doesn't count. There's nothing there for you. But now if you want to do it, you can start over. He said, do you think God will forgive me? He said, could you forgive me? I said, it doesn't matter if I forgive you or not. What matters is that, yes, God can forgive anything except shark. He can forgive anything. But it's between you and him, not between you and me. I'm disappointed in you, and I'm disappointed in me for not seeing through it. But I always give people the benefit of the doubt. He changed himself amazing. He, he really did. The guy became, if you'd have seen him the day he did this real Shahada, and then a year later, you said it's not the same person. He looked taller, looked straighter, looked like light coming from his face. He was a very beautiful person. He changed totally. Then he stayed away from lies. He stayed away from all this, uh, you know, espionage kind of stuff. He became a responsible citizen. Alhamdulillah. So we want to talk about the truthfulness. I want to tell you what Allah said about this. This is in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And Allah is talking about hypocrites. Hypocrites. People who say one thing, but they don't really believe it. And of mankind, there are those who say, we believe in Allah. Aman Billah. We believe in Allah. And the last day, Yawm al -akhir. But they don't believe. They think they're going to beguile, that's the word they used here in the translation, they're going to trick Allah and those who believe, and they're going to only trick themselves. But they don't catch that, they don't perceive it. In their hearts is a disease, and Allah will increase them in that disease, and a painful doom is waiting for them because they lie. They are called munafikeen, liars and hypocrites. When they're with us, Muslims, they're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm with you guys. But when they go back to their devil friends, they say, oh, no, we're just jiving those guys. We're with you. This is the way of them. You read about it in the first part of Surah Baqarah. Allah talks about believers in the first few verses. Then he talks about disbelievers in the next few verses. But then Allah spends a lot of time talking about hypocrites. And this is not new. If you were a Christian, you know about hypocrites. You heard about them real well. You heard about the Pharisees. Jesus called them the worst of the hypocrites. Read Matthew 5, 17. When he said that he came not to destroy the law. He did not come to do, do away with the Old Testament law, the laws of Moses. He said, I didn't come to destroy the prophets. He didn't come to put down the, the prophets. He said, rather, I came to fulfill. He's with those prophets, just as Muhammad was. He said, I come to fulfill the law and the prophets, and not until all things are accomplished, so a single dot, jot, or iota be in any wise lesson. And whoever breaks the least commandment of a law and teaches that, he'll be the least in the kingdom, but whoever keeps the commandments and teaches that, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. Now listen to what comes next. This is in your Bible. Go look at it. It says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of these Pharisees. Pharisees are the one who were running the temple at that time. They were the ones in charge. Unless your righteousness is more than theirs, you will in no wise enter the kingdom. Why? Because it's very simple. They're hypocrites. Same thing that Muhammad said. Prophet Muhammad said, Allah is going to start the fire of hell with the hypocrites that were preaching the religion but didn't live it. It's a good lesson. So that sincerity is a big thing. And that's what we're coming up to next. So we talked about truth. You have to say it in truth. Now let's go to sincerity. al Zumer, chapter, uh, is verse 2. It says, Worship Allah, make religion pure for Him. And there is another re uh, reference for this one in Surah Bayana, talking about what I was just talking about. Allah tells us about the people before, the Jews and the Christians, that when they were ordered by their prophets, they were commanded nothing else than what? And Allah says, Wa ma umiru illa and the people before were not ordered anything more 
than to worship Allah alone without partners, keep the religion pure for him, establish the worship called Salah, pay the charity to the poor people, and that's the true religion of Almighty God. That's what it says. Chapter 98, verse 5. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Allah has forbidden hellfire for anybody who said there is no one worthy of worship except Allah, and they say so desiring the face and pleasure of Allah. So that's something for us to really think about there. Let's go to number seven. The seventh point is mahabba. What is that? Love. Love. Now, you don't hear Muslims talk about this very much. You know, usually you think, oh, there's a Christian preaching that love stuff. Yes, there's lots of loves, man, you know, and uh, we love and everybody loves and it's a religion of love, 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 love. They even write love, you know, on the side of those missiles when they send it to the people in Afghanistan. And so, <laughs> but we'll come back to what we're saying here. Surah so, Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 165, and this is what Allah says. Yet of mankind are some who take unto themselves objects of worship as rivals to Allah. They love them with a love that should be only for Allah. However, those who believe are stronger in their love of Allah. So the real love in this life is the love of Allah. In, now, a woman loves a man. A man loves a woman. But that should never get to the point where it becomes obsession because that's not love anymore. That becomes lust. That becomes something of a mental condition with a person. The obsession with a human being needs to be for the only one who will never disappoint them. And it's okay to have the obsession of love for Allah because he will never disappoint you. But a human will always disappoint you because humans are not perfect. Do not use that beautiful love capacity that you have for anything other than Allah. Got it? That's a special thing you have. It's a gift. Don't waste it on something that you can see or hear or touch or feel or smell because it's going to go away. But the one thing that you can't even describe, the one who created you, Allah, it never go away. And that's the one we want to be close to in the next life. That's the real goal of the Muslim. The real purpose that we have here. I want to be close to my Lord. I want to be with Him. I love Him. He is my object of my affection. I want to be close to Him. This is what Muslims are after. The closer we can get to Him, the better. And in the next life, the closest to Him is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon Him. And then the other prophets right around Him. They're the closest to Almighty Allah. And who are the people closest to them? And that's going to be those who sacrificed in this life and believed and were steadfast even through the calamities, even through the difficulties, and they will have the highest place. And does that make sense? Of course. Who suffers the most for the cause should be paid the most. And this is how it is in Islam. Allah says about this, and this is in chapter 9, Surah al verse 24, Say, if your fathers or your sons or your brothers, or your wives, or your tribe, or your wealth that you acquire, or merchandise that you fear that you will not be able to sell, or your dwellings become dearer to you than Allah and His Messenger, and striving in His way, then wait. Then wait till Allah brings His command to pass. Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. That's number seven, the love for Allah. Number eight is denial of false worship. And Allah says in chapter 2, verse 256, He says, La ikraha fadeen kat ta bayna rushtu min al ghai. Fama yad forbid to guti wa yumin ballahi falkadis tam sakabula wa tu wit kalan fisamalaha. Wallahu samiyun ali. And part of it it says, and whoever rejects tagut, false deities, and believes in Allah, he has grasped a firm handhold that will never break. So whatever you do, don't give up on this one. Always deny false worship. 
And number nine is the adherence of this until death. And I mentioned that from the beginning of our talk earlier today. And this means that, and Allah says in Surah 3, Surah Al Imran, verse 102, O believers, observe your duty to Allah with the right observance and die not except in the state of Islam. Ya yuludin amanu attaqallah haqat tukatihi wa la tamutuna illa wa antum muslimun. So these are the keys to the paradise, the keys to the shahada. And I'll repeat them again, is to have the correct knowledge of what you're saying, the certainty without doubt, the acceptance, the full acceptance and being willing to go for it, the submission to Allah and the truthfulness in what you're saying, the sincerity to back it up and the love, the full love for Allah and what the message is about, the denial of any other gods, and then finally is to stay on that until you die. Wala tamutuna illa wa antum muslimun. That's the nine points of the shahada. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, hu alladhi ja'alna muslimin. The praise to Allah, the one that made us into Muslims. This is Yusuf Estes, and we're here today in Chicago, the Windy City. And uh, by the way, if you didn't know this, that story of the Windy City has nothing to do with the wind off the lake. It has to do with people politically stumping over a hundred years ago, and when they used to get up on their soapboxes and holler out, to vote for me, vote for me, and they'd give their long-winded speeches, and that's where Chicago got the name Windy City. Now, don't you feel educated knowing that? Alhamdulillah. And we're here today in the offices of the ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America. And they do run around, but they don't run around in circles. Not here. Right, guys? That's right. And also with us today is the Dean Show. You're watching the Dean Show. And along with that, we're also recording under the auspices of ShareIslam.com. So we got a lot going on here. We've got radio and we've got uh, live broadcast on the Internet. And we also have a recording that we're making for the Internet, television, replaying and broadcasting at the Dean Show. And so a lot of stuff's happening here. Now to our subject. We have been talking here with our new Muslims and some older Muslims and some non-Muslims about the subject of Islam and what it takes to enter and something it's called the Shahada. And uh, I think that's what we pick up with that. And then we'll go to the questions that go along with this thing called the Shahada. There's something that is called uh, Shahada and it means to bear witness. Bear witness to the fact that there's only one God and that I'm going to worship him on his terms, not my terms. And I'm going to accept the messenger who brought the message. That's basically what you're saying in the Shahada. Shadu la ilaha illallah wa ashar Muhammadin abduhu rasul. This is the Shahada. There are nine points which we discovered in the first part of the program. They are knowledge, certainty, acceptance, submission, truth, sincerity, love, denial, and adherence. And if you hear them out of context, you might say, what is that? Love and denial, what is that all about? But uh, if you listen to the first part of the program, you understood it in the context it's intended, and that's what's important. Now, let us come to some of the questions that have arised here from this little talk that we had and see what we can learn from the question and then if we can get any benefit from an answer. One of our uh, guests asked about shirk and said that it appears that the only thing God is not going to forgive is shirk. This is mentioned, by the way, in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 48. Verily, Allah does not forgive shirk, but anything less than this he can forgive. So what is the blasphemous thing called shirk? What is that? And why won't Allah forgive it? Shirk, according to Islam, 
is the worst blasphemy and it is the unforgivable sin. There's no way to get back from that unless the person repents of it and never does it again in their life up until they die. So there is a way to get over it if you're still alive. But if a person dies on it, then they're stuck with it. And this is to make partners with Allah in worship. If a person understands the first commandment in the Old Testament, they will know that this is exactly what it's saying. Thou shalt not have other gods beside God. He is the only God worthy of any worship. So when people set up false gods as worship beside him, this is something that he will not tolerate. That's why it's commandment number one. It came with Moses like that. You will find it in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and in the book of Deuteronomy, and that's going to be in chapter 5. Check it out. And make sure I'm telling you the right thing. Then, look again in the book of Hosea. You're going to find it again there, chapter 13. Look in the book of Isaiah, and you're going to find it again. The importance of worshiping only one God. Now look to the New Testament and see when Jesus is being asked... What is the greatest commandment? He was being asked by the Pharisees themselves to see if he would say the right thing. And they, they were, of course, uh, not surprised to hear him say this because he was not asking people to worship him. If anybody had a doubt that he was saying, worship me, he clearly says, the greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord and you have to worship him alone without any partners. He said it like this, though, and the translation says that you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. Then I give you a commandment like unto it to love your brother as yourself. I heard a preacher say real clear one time that Jesus brought a new commandment when he brought that. And that's strange because the quote that he gave is an old commandment, the oldest of the, and the first of the commandments, and it is mentioned in the book that I just told you about, and it says exactly the same words and a commandment like it, which is to love your brother as yourself. But in any way, that, that's to let you know what the, the previous monotheistic approach was, and it's still no different with Muhammad, that the first and foremost object of worship has to be a law. Almighty God alone without any partners. Anything less than that is not acceptable. It is short and it will condemn a person to hellfire regardless of how many so-called good deeds, good works, charity, worship that they've given to Allah. But if they put something with it, they canceled it because it is not open for anything other than 100% for God. And, if, and it, in the Bible, it's compared to a relationship of marriage. It's very often compared to a relationship of marriage in the Bible as though someone is being adulterous by going after these other gods. And a, a woman would never tolerate her husband to say that, well, I, you know, I really haven't committed adultery except just a little bit, and it was really with your own sister, so you should feel like, uh, you know, hey, that's a benefit to you there. No woman would accept that. No man would accept some kind of statement like that. And so you see, this is the kind of thing that's being brought up in the Bible for them to look at. But Allah is giving you something even more clear when Allah tells you that he's not going to accept even a 0.1%. It has to be all for him. And he says in the Quran, Kul in kuntun tuhibun Allah fatabi uni yubbikum Allah. Wa yagfir lakum dunubukum. Wa Allahu ghafurahim. And this meaning more or less would be in English that Allah is telling you that if you really love Allah, there has to be some demonstration of what you said because you have to follow Prophet Muhammad. If you really love Allah, he's giving you this challenge. Then you follow my Prophet. You follow Muhammad and then Allah will love you. So this is not going to be reciprocal unless you do it his way. You're not going to be able to make up your own religion. You're not going to be able to come up with your own little scheme of things. You're going to have to do what he wants you to do on his terms. Not negotiable. Again, I'm going to repeat this. Not negotiable. It's his way or no way. And not part way. So that's shirk and that's the explanation of it. The second question we had here is talking about what, what about if I come to Islam and I have some of my relatives 
and my children and they don't like Islam because they say, oh, there's things they don't want to do. A girl, for instance, would say, I don't see why I should cover my beauty. I'm beautiful. So why should I cover that up? Islam is telling me I should cover up. Aha. Uh -huh. That's a point. Let's deal with that one first. There's an there's a, a and a B to this. That was A. The girl is saying she's beautiful. Well, to who? To who? And if you need to go down the street and show all your beauty to everybody, why? What are you trying to troll for? What are you trying to catch on your hook there? What's going on with your life? You need everybody to look at you. Because if this is your case, maybe you should get some counseling before you get in trouble. Because when women walk down the street half naked, they get raped. They get hurt. They get abused. Or they wind up in relationships with people who only went after them for what they thought was physical beauty. And by the way, you've heard the expression, beauty is only skin deep. Well, by the way, it doesn't take long for people's skin to change. When people start getting older and start sagging and getting wrinkles, all of a sudden, she's going to be thrown out in the garbage. We have a country full of people been thrown in the garbage after they didn't have those so-called good looks anymore. So a lot of them wind up on drugs, hanging out with the wrong people. And drugs don't take a long time to destroy your looks, do they? Not at all. If you doubt what I said, just go out here tonight. I'm sure you got streets close to here. You can go out tonight and see all that you want. Really, really ugly. Islam is protecting your beauty. And you're showing your beauty to the right one. Who should you be beautiful for? If you're a girl and you want to show your beauty off, who should it be for? Your husband. Why somebody else's husband? Were well, you trying to make that girl upset and jealous with you? Is that, is that how you get your, your, your happy mood come to you off of that? Huh? So Islam is showing you your beauty is to be protected from people who don't need to see it. But you want to show your beauty around your home, your family, your husband, and sure, that's right. But the problem we have in this country is the women want to put all of her stuff on and get all the, huh? The face is made up, the hair is made up, and get out here with almost being dressed, not quite, and go down the street. And strangers, total strangers going, hey, baby, how bright. Who's that? What is that? You see these guys, right? They consider they're not even manly if they can't, you know, check out the girls, whistle at them, touch them, pinch them, things like that. And they don't realize that this is nothing. This is absolutely nothing. It's so superficial and it's trashy. If that is your idea of beauty, then you need to redefine. You need to go back to the dictionary and think again what is beauty. Because true beauty comes from a person who is humble and kind and sincere. A person who is thinking and using their thinking process to benefit themselves, their family, and their society that they live in. This is something beautiful. One who suffers and sacrifices for the sake of their beliefs. One who's willing to stand firm on what is right and righteous. Not somebody that's willing to take off their clothes and walk down the street thinking that's going to get something going on. If that's your concept of beauty, you need to go back and start all over again. Because it's ugly. To me, the most beautiful women are those who cover themselves. Because then I can appreciate them for who they are instead of what they are. And there's a big difference. You don't, uh, <laughs> the same poor lost souls who run around like that are the same ones who say, I don't want to be treated like an object. <laughs> Islam is the one protecting you from being treated like an object. Part B. This is the one that I can relate to real well. It says, what about my son who says, well, gee whiz, you know, Islam has got a lot of stuff that kind of looks girly to me. You're talking about shaving under your armpits. You're talking about uh, sitting down when you go to the toilet, things like that. What is that all about? Well, if you're raised in a society where people don't do that, of course you would think it was strange. This sounds very strange. But on the other hand, I want to tell you that there's a lot of things in the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu that are going to sound strange to people who don't know. But I'll just ask you, don't accept Islam, but do accept rational thinking. Is that fair? Rational thinking. That's fair, isn't it? Prophet Muhammad 
Peace and blessing be upon him taught us everything we need to do as a human being to live in the best condition in the best state. That's why he came as a mercy to the Alameen, to the human beings. He is our mercy man. We look to him for whatever we need. He's got an answer for your question. No other religion on earth shows you the proper way to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. And if you doubt it, willing to give you a tape and you can check it out, listen to the whole thing. But I'll give you one sample. One is that when a person goes to the toilet, they sit, and this is well known, it's not anything to be ashamed of, they sit, they don't stand. They're careful not to get anything of the, what they eliminate on themselves or their clothes. Very careful about it. Then when they're through eliminating, they wash themselves. They do what? They wash themselves with water on their hand. This, they clean the part that has been affected and soiled, and they get it clean before they stand up. Now, I heard from some people, they said, oh, that sounds so barbaric. We're modern. We use toilet paper. Really, rational thinking. We agreed, right? Rational thinking. You're out in the yard. Mom says, pick up the newspaper. You reach down, you grab the newspaper. Oh, man, the newspaper boy threw it right where the dog was. And I got that on my hand. The dog do. Got it? What I'm going to do? Oh, well, use the newspaper and wipe it off, right? Or are you going to go over to the sprinkler, to the water faucet, and wash it off? Which one? Which one? And you already know the answer. The paper just smears it all over the place. Plus, now what am I going to do with all this paper? Or I can just turn the water on and wash it off. Now the rationale comes in and you go, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. But because you've been raised a certain way, that's what you know. But until your rational thinking kicks in, you don't catch it. I'll give you one more before I leave the subject, because it's very important for you to catch this. The importance of the sunnah. You don't need to understand it, but you do need to understand that you need it. Got it? You don't need to understand it, but you need to understand that you need it. I was driving home from a fundraiser one night, very late at night. I was exhausted. <laughs> Pulled up the stoplight. I put my head down on the steering wheel. And I said, I can't drive anymore. I can't. I give up. I've been up too many hours. My little daughter was with me. She reached over and turned the radio on full blast to wake me up. And I listened to talk shows, so I hear somebody talking. First words out of his mouth, he says, always sit down when you eat or drink. I said, huh? He said, never stand up when you eat or drink. I said, man, I sound like Jamaat Tabliks in town. What is that? Because these guys are always saying that. These are Muslims who travel around preaching some good things about Islam. And they are saying this, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us, always sit down when you eat or drink. Don't ever stand up when you eat or drink. Now, hey, I live in America. We walk around. We eat hot dogs and drink soda. And we, we can eat and run. You see people running down. I'm going to lose some weight, you know. <laughs> and he's walking around, going on, <laughs> he's running, eating a sandwich. But here we have something in Islam telling you, you know, you sit down. You sit down when you eat, and you sit down when you eliminate. This is what we're told. Then the voice on the radio continued for the next half hour explaining why you must never stand. It was a doctor and surgeon. And he's telling us all of the damage being caused to our bodies on a regular basis. Almost every human being in the United States of America is suffering from one or the other of the following diseases. And he started naming them. And I had like two or three of them myself. And one of them is a problem with this esophagus. And another one was a hiatal hernia. Another one you have with a problem in the stomach. Another one that you have in the neck. Another one you have with your kidneys. And he named all these problems. He said, every one of these could be prevented if you sat down when you ate or drank. And this man never heard of Islam in his life. Now, if you heard the why and you said, okay, now I'm going to do it, guess what? You better hope for Allah's mercy because so far you're only going to get the reward of having a better health but not the reward of following the Prophet because you didn't follow him, you followed the doctor. You follow that? Now I'm going to take a break here and I'm going to come back but we've got a lot to talk about on these subjects of questions here and you are listening to Share Islam and we're going to be back with more.